So welcome uh, everyone. We're going to um, to begin the webinar in, in a minute or so. All right, so I think I can I can start. So hello and uh, and welcome to the uh, Building Envelope Campaign uh, webinar series. Um, in this series, um, we share technical assistance and recognition opportunities through four of the Department of Energy's technology campaigns, uh, the Building Envelope Campaign, uh, the Efficient and Healthy Schools Campaign, the Integrated Lighting Campaign, and the upcoming uh, Storm uh, Window and Insulating Panel Campaign. Uh, it highlights free engagement and recognition opportunities and features campaign participants sharing practical approaches to improving uh, energy efficiency. Uh, so before uh, we get started, uh, there are just a few uh, housekeeping points uh, I'd like to share. Um, just note that today's webinar uh, will be recorded and archived on uh, Better Building Solution Center. So we will follow up when today's recording and slides are available. Uh, next, um, as attendees, uh, you are in listen only mode. So that means your microphones are muted. So if you are having uh, any audio or visual issues throughout the webinar, uh, please uh, send a message uh, via the Q&A box, which is located on the bottom of your Zoom panel. Uh, and then we'll try to, uh, to help you. So next slide. So my name is Anthony uh, Aldikiewicz, and I'm going to be your moderator uh, for today. I am a senior R&D member at Oak Ridge National Lab and part of the Building Envelope uh, Materials Research Group. So next slide. So here is the um, agenda for today. So today uh, you're going to hear from multiple uh, DOE technology campaigns. I'm going to start us off. Uh, by talking to you about the host of this webinar series, the Building Envelope Campaign. Uh, and then you will hear from the Integrated Lighting Campaign, and then we'll end with the uh, Efficient and Healthy Schools Campaign before we close for a brief Q&A uh, session. So um, if we go to the next slide. Um, so the Building Envelope Campaign. Uh, next slide. Uh, so before I, I continue, what I, I want to do is recognize the organizer, organizers rather of our campaign. And uh, those are the American Institute of Architects, uh, the International Facility Management Association, and the International Institute of Building Enclosure Consultants. So without their uh, support, a lot of what I'll be talking about wouldn't have been uh, possible. So really appreciate uh, their participation as organizers. So the next slide, please. So how to assess for overall uh, building envelope performance? Uh, that's the challenge that we face. So unlike uh, energy loads from equipment and lighting, directly measuring overall uh, performance of the building envelope um, is impossible. Um, we can measure air leakage, uh, but we can't directly measure thermal performance considering all the other elements that make up the envelope. So to simplify things um, a bit, what we did was develop a metric or measure uh, that accounts for the performance of the envelope holistically. So accounting for the walls, the roof, uh, fenestrations, air leakage, uh, and external loads, uh, which are dependent on climate. So next slide. So as a result, what we did was we developed uh, the building envelope performance or BEP metric. And in this case, you know, the heating and cooling loads are equivalent to the building envelope energy loads plus uh, any internal loads. So like whole building energy calculations, uh, the building envelope performance metric has units of KBTUs per square foot. The difference is that it's based on the surface area of the building envelope, not the area of conditioned floor space. And what's neat about, about this approach is that all the user needs to know is location, building type, wall area, window area, the air leakage, uh, if they can measure it, uh, and the value, the insulation value of the opaque uh, portions of the wall. So next slide. 
So having developed this approach, really the goal for us was now to get, get it in the hands of practitioners. So hence the genesis of the Building Envelope campaign. Under the auspices of, a, of the Better Buildings Technology campaign, the Building Envelope campaign was launched. So the intent was simple, and that's really to help practitioners design more energy efficient buildings by introducing a new assessment tool uh, that's easy to use compared to whole building energy calculation. And what this does is provide users a simple, quick, and quick way to easily assess different building envelope options. It also gives users guidance with respect to what part of the envelope has the biggest impact uh, on performance. So the building envelope campaign provides targeted guidance with respect to what part of the envelope would benefit from most energy improvements, such as additional insulation, you know, more thermally resistant windows uh, and or reduced air, air leakage. Um, in addition, what the Building Envelope Campaign provides or points users to are resources that are meant to help with respect to design, you know, via material systems and, and case studies. Next slide. So our, our goals are, are simple, and that's uh, to motivate action and increase awareness, uh, recognize uh, those uh, leaders in uh, building envelope design and demonstrate and, and document uh, performance. So really it's to help folks realize the benefits of investing in building envelope performance improvements, whether new construction uh, or retrofits, um, to recognize those that are leading uh, the effort to design uh, more energy efficient, sustainable uh, buildings, and to communicate those benefits by quantifying uh, energy and, and cost savings that results from design construction, uh, commissioning, and maintenance, uh, maintenance rather, of high performing uh, building envelope systems. So next slide. So how do we get there? Uh, so there are a couple of ways uh, to uh, benefit uh, from the, the building envelope campaign, and that's uh, as a supporter or as a participant. As a supporter, uh, you'll have uh, access to the people and resources uh, that make up the, the building envelope campaign. Uh, you can partner with team members to help promote benefits uh, of, of the campaign. Uh, and in addition, you know, you'll, there is recognition as a supporter um, as well as access to other supporters and participants uh, of the campaign. So those would be the benefits of a supporter. Participants, they're the ones that are actually using the tool uh, in, in their projects. Um, so as a participant, you'll have access to the te technical export, experts resources, uh, and lastly, the recognition uh, piece. So as far as technical experts and resources, you know we're here available to you to provide you guidance in, in helping you select um, or design your building envelope system. Um, the recognition part, uh, that comes in the form of awards and or uh, participation in case studies. And, and just a, a quick note, this last bullet here, um, I wanted to let folks know that um, if, if there's a project that's been completed since January of 2019, um, and that you feel the improvements made are worth recognition, uh, you can register and submit your, your project to the campaign. Uh, so it's not late, too late to, to do that. Um, so let's now just, oh, next slide, please. So let's talk a little bit about uh, recognition uh, it, for the campaign. So recognition comes in, in um, two forms, two categories, and each category has, has two tiers. So there's a, a retrofit category and a new construction uh, category. So for retrofit, you have retro 30 and, and retro 50. And what these numbers represent are basically improvements in, uh, in performance with respect to the, to the base case. So in this case, it would be your, your initial construction with no, no retrofit improvement. And, and so that's basically what it is. It's 30% over the, over the base case or 50% over the base case. Um, for new construction, we have novel 20 and, and novel 40. And here the performance improvement in this case is relative to code compliant buildings. Uh, and we're using uh, ASHRAE 90.1 2016 as our standard. So a 20, a novel 20 would be 20% improvement over that uh, code compliant uh, building. And we also recognize 
Uh, those efforts that are focused on building envelope improvements in underserved communities and serve as role models for, for the rest of the industry. So we do, we do make an effort to recognize that effort. Uh, and lastly, um, we want to recognize those designs that, for example, don't meet uh, the criteria for an award, but make an impact or a difference that merits recognition and raising awareness uh, to the rest of the building community. I mean, the goal is to, to try to build on best practices. Um, next slide. So here's a, a bit of history regarding the campaign. So the campaign was launched in, in 2020, uh, just about the time uh, when the country started shutting down uh, for COVID. Um, fortunately, we're now in our, our second year and looking for continued participation. The campaign remains open uh, to both participants and supporters. And I encourage those of you that are interested to sign up. It's very easy, uh, very easy to do. Um, and we continue to accept and review submittals from participants. And as I mentioned um, earlier, uh, the projects completed since January of 20, 2019 are eligible for submission. Um, the submission deadline uh, is April 8th of this year. And so we hope uh, to hold, you know, based on how reviews go and how many submissions that we have, uh, is a recognition or award uh, ceremony uh, in the summer or fall of, of this year. So that's the goal. Um, the neat thing about this is that there's no obligation to join. The campaign is free. Uh, and if, if you are a supporter and you do have a project that you're interested in switching uh, or evaluating, then switching over as a, a participant is very easy to do. And, and if, you, if you have trouble with that, uh, just reach out to us and, and let us know. We can help you uh, with that. Next slide. So um, now what I want to do is, is just let you know how we did in the first year. So uh, we had a total of, of 16 buildings rather submitted uh, for review. Uh, 14 of those uh, constructions uh, or improvements were eligible for, uh, for recognition. Uh, of those buildings, three of them were educational projects. Uh, in total, uh, the buildings accounted for just over one and a half million square feet of condition space. Uh, the net savings annually was about 9 million uh, KBTU, and that was based on, on just the building envelope improvements alone. So that was pretty, pretty neat. We had a, a, a wide representation of, of building types. Uh, we also had representation across different sectors, you know, healthcare, education, commercial, and industrial. A uh, building size size ranged from from 50,000 square feet to uh, about 500,000 square feet. So it was a good good representation of, of buildings. Uh, next slide. So what I'll do now is just just quickly cover uh, some of the the awards that were given. Uh, so this is under the category of retrofit. Uh, so the B246 apartment building that's located in Virginia. And uh, some of the notable improvements that they made to achieve a uh, 30% uh, reduction in, in, um, in, prefer, in energy loads, rather, was by installing uh, low e storm uh, windows in that case. Um, the Retro 50 Award, here are three uh, examples of Retro 50 Awards. I'm going to just highlight American uh, Geophysical Union Building, which is the picture on the right. Uh, that building is located in Washington, D.C. This building is a, a net zero energy building, so they easily achieved retro 50. Um, and one of the improvements they made, which, which I wanted to highlight, was the use of, of chromic windows. So chromic windows, I don't know if you're familiar with them. If you, if you notice, your, if you have glasses that have transition lenses, they basically change uh, color. They dynamically transition between clean and dark, clear and dark, rather. And so that will impact the solar loads uh, or solar heat gains that the building uh, sees internally. And so that's uh, one neat technology that was used to uh, help them realize uh, retro booking. So uh, next uh, slide. So the new construction projects, uh, here are some examples of, of projects that achieved novel 20 and 40 awards. Uh, the projects highlighted in green also represent academic buildings. Um, I will comment on one, and that's the Boulder Valley School District Education Center. So this project was part of a $677 million K-12 
countywide initiative to improve energy performance of all of the academic buildings in the county, including construction of new buildings. Uh, this project achieved novel 40, which is 40% improvement in energy performance over code compliant building. And they did it uh, by addressing a host of, of issues. So they, they addressed daylighting, right? They increased the level of roof and, and wall insulation. I think that was almost by a factor of two. And then they also reduced air leakage by implementation of air bar an air barrier system. Uh, and when they measured performance, uh, their air leakage was reduced by, by just almost 30%, I think, compared to code. Uh, compared to code. So that, that was a pretty, a pretty neat story. If you want to learn uh, more about this project, uh, I, would, I would point you to a YouTube video. Jeff Medwitz, he's the project manager uh, of energy systems for the Boulder County School District. He put together a really nice uh, five-minute video describing, describing the project. Uh, and you can find that video on, on YouTube. And, and if you have trouble, uh, just, just uh, give me a shout and I'll point you to the link. But all you need to do is just search for building envelope campaign and, and you'll you'll find it and throw in the Boulder Valley School District and, and you'll see it. He did a really nice job. I encourage you to take a look at it. Uh, next slide. So with that, I'm going to uh, hand it over to Hannah Carter. She's a participant in the building envelope campaign. And so I'll let her introduce herself and talk to you about uh, about her project. So Hannah, it's, it's all yours. Thanks, Anthony. We can go to the next slide. So my name is Hannah Carter, and I am the sustainability coordinator at Parkway School District. Um, and I'm going to be talking about our participation in the building envelope campaign. Next slide. So a little bit about our school district. We're a public school district located in St. Louis, Missouri. So about 20 minutes outside of the city uh, with approximately 18,000 students, around 2,000 staff. Um, we have around 34 buildings uh, compromising um, three and a half billion square feet. Um, our school district has set a number of sustainability goals, uh, which has tied us into some of these other campaigns with um, better buildings. And one of those being the Better Buildings Challenge, which is where we first learned about the building envelope campaign. Um, and through the Better Buildings Challenge, we have set a goal for 35% energy reduction by 2025. That was our second goal after we met our first goal of a 20% energy reduction. Um, some other programs that we've participated in are the US Department of Education Green Ribbon School, so we're a Green Ribbon District. Um, and we were also awarded the Energy Star Partner of the Year Award in 2021. Um, so all of this work around sustainability and saving energy, uh, it's, it's been integrated into our school district culture for a long time. Um, and it has a direct tie into our district strategic plan. Um, have that quote there to, to integrate environmentally sustainability, environmentally, socially, and fiscally sustainable best practices into every department. So just a little background there. Next slide. So more into our strategies around energy savings as a school district. Um, we have created sustainability and energy related board policies and administrative procedures to help guide our work through the district and solidify it long term. Um, something I know I'm going to be touching on here more is our capital replacement and building design processes including uh, implementing the ASHRAE 50% advanced energy design guidelines into our specifications. Um, we do a lot of retrofits. So everything from lighting, envelope, um, water savings, because we don't build a lot of new buildings. So for the most part, we're just looking to retrofit our older existing buildings that we do have. We've implemented a lot of energy savings strategies into our purchasing policies. So Energy Star equipment, um, trying not to buy one for one equipment, getting something that is more energy efficient if possible every time that we're moving forward and purchasing. Uh, we do a lot of behavior change campaigns with students and staff, um, competitions throughout the school district, staff trainings, professional development. Um, teaching students about our energy systems that we have, whether that's our renewable energy, solar arrays, our geothermal heat pump systems, all of that, so that they can really get that sense of, 
uh, how are we how are we making a difference every day and how can they get involved in it in real world applications? Um, and then part of my role is heavy on the monitoring and analysis side. So using our building automation system to monitor our HVAC systems. Um, same thing with our fault detection software, really trying to optimize and fine tune where we can. Um, and then benchmarking all of our utility data and doing retro commissioning projects on our buildings um, as we can. Next slide. So more about how we joined the Building Envelope campaign. As I said, we learned about the Building Envelope campaign through the Better Buildings Summit last year. Um, and being partners with that, we knew that Better Buildings campaigns are great and a great source of resources. Um, and so when we learned about the different information needed to go into the building envelope campaign, I immediately thought about our, our specs that we've integrated the ASHRAE 50% advanced energy design guidelines with the muscle into our master district specifications. And every summer we typically have at least one school that needs a new roof, half a new roof, whatever the portion is. Um, and through those specifications, all of our roof replacements have been going to um, R30 roof from the existing R8. So a substantial improvement to the insulative value of our roofs. Um, and so this data we've been collecting, uh, it was easy for us to collect this data because we were already submitting it for utility rebates, which I would encourage if you're participating in the building envelope campaign, you can probably show your energy savings to your utility and potentially get some rebates there if you have a similar program in your area. Um, so all this data was handy um, for that reason. Off to the right, there's kind of a screenshot of this, the uh, ASHRAE Advanced Energy Design Guidelines that I keep talking about. We also um, strive towards their net zero energy guidelines when possible. Um, and down on the bottom right is a photo of one of our elementary schools that this upcoming year we hope to also include in the building envelope campaign. This is a school with a lot of solar, but they're getting a lot of new roofing as well. Um, and then just kind of showing in the bottom, the that's the screenshot from the ASHRAE Advanced Energy Design Guidelines recommending um, R30 roofing insulative value. Next slide. So some of the reasons that we decided to join the campaign um, are the wide array of benefits to participants. So first off, being recognized for this work, it allows us to do more of the work. Um, so when we get recognized for this, we gain a lot of support internally from our administration, our Board of Education, and even our community that votes for our bond issues that we pass that help fund these projects and keep uh, more energy efficiency projects rolling. It also allows us to um, share our story with other schools locally and nationally and get more people on board. Um, and it is, it'll be great to be able to create a fact sheet and a video with uh, Anthony and his team to promote and share our projects. Um, another big benefit to participating in the Building Envelope campaign are that when you're making improvements to your building, Envelope, you're doing a lot of energy reductions, like we talked about, um, but including in that, you're often improving your indoor air quality um, and improving occupant comfort, which for schools all the time, but especially right now, is super important. Um, we've also found that when we're coupling our roof replacements with more insulative, um, energy efficient roofing, we're often able to downsize our HVAC equipment because our thermal load has been reduced by the extra insulation. Um, more cost savings are that by showing these energy savings, we're often able to get utility rebates. Um, so for the three projects that we submitted this year, uh, we expect to get $16,000 back in utility rebates alone. Um, and then we use these rebates to then do more energy efficiency projects kind of in a revolving fund. Um, more reasons to, to participate are just the support from the team um, and the easy to use tools in this program. So the tools, once you have the data to plug into the tools about your building, I think it took me maybe 10 minutes to get the screenshot you kind of see below the percent improvement 
um, on one of our buildings. So super easy to use. Um, and then anytime you have questions, the team is very supportive and can help give you suggestions on more ways to improve um, and any data that you need. So that's all I had, next slide. Okay, I'm up. Thanks, Hannah. Um, hi, everyone. Um, thanks for having me. I'm going to talk a little bit about the integrated lighting campaign. My name is Axel Pearson. I work at uh, Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. So I'm going to give you just a quick five minute overview of the campaign. It's really not too much different in structure uh, and goals than Anthony talked about with the building envelope campaign, but this one is focused on lighting. So if I pique your interest today, uh, we have a couple webinars coming up uh, in the next month or so where I'll go into much more detail. So if you're interested in that, shoot me an email for more information. Um, my contact info, I think, will be displayed at the end of the webinar. OK, next slide. Oh, let's go one more. OK, so just like the name sounds, um, the integrated lighting campaign focuses on not only lighting, but integrated lighting. And that means that the lighting system can communicate with other building systems to enhance building performance. But that, that's not all the campaign is interested in. There are still luminaires and luminaire systems, lighting systems that we're hoping to capture as well. Um, and that's like advanced systems uh, and controls and lighting that really improve uh, lighting performance. We're definitely interested in that. So we'd love to hear uh, how systems are going above and beyond things like simple occupancy sensors. Uh, or daylighting uh, or scheduling. So any of those really innovative ap approaches, but back to um, integrated lighting. So really today's lighting can communicate with other building systems to achieve uh, deeper energy savings within the building. For example, by exchanging information with the HVAC, uh, HVAC system or controllable loads. Um, and while the integrated systems energy benefits often result in a favorable um, ROI, Though there are some non-energy benefits associated with integrated lighting that really may tap into a higher value proposition that you know can further tip the scale in, in, in favor of adopting these systems. Um, an example of non-energy benefits is space utilization uh, and uh, such analyses that kind of leverage the occupancy sensors that are already there for the lighting system. This can give you information on space optimization and layouts. In a school, this might be helpful in identifying if certain classrooms are, are more occupied than others, or maybe a common area that are used inconsistently so you can get, uh, get people to use and spread out the building and use it uh, more efficiently. Uh, maybe a corridor is more crowded than others and you can kind of <laughs> change rooms around and, and reroute students. It could be helpful with, again, space efficiency, um, but also like social distance planning, right? We want uh, folks maybe not to be as close as they possibly can, but use the space in the school. Um, another uh, example might be asset tracking, which is common a common feature with some of these integrated systems. And that can help locate equipment like the laptop cart in your school or something like that. So anyway, through the ILC, we hope to learn and recognize some of these innovative lighting projects. And uh, I think schools are a pretty good candidate for these types of systems. So uh, really be interested to see some schools come through with this campaign as they did for the building envelope campaign. Next slide. So uh, there's some resources on our website, uh, things like reports, case studies, um, national, uh, case studies from the research labs, other 30 third party organizations. Uh, utility incentives, they uh, can help provide financial support for those taking on these advanced lighting projects. Webinars or trainings are still uh, are also listed on there, along with um, topic relevant videos. Um, so I encourage you to check out our website when you get a chance. That'd be great. Next slide. Okay, so this is really about recognition, recognition and this is the main uh, goal of the program. So we want to recognize those innovative advanced lighting projects, and they're kind of based on these six major categories, two of which on the right hand side are new. Um, so starting on the left, there's the advanced use of sensors and controls for lighting like connected lighting systems and networked lighting controls. Then there's um, integrated controls for plug loads and HVAC with those lighting systems. And that's kind of what I was talking about a little bit where lighting systems helps in uh, systems help inform those other bu uh, building systems. 
There's also integration with other systems. And here, there's so many possibilities. Um, the lighting system can interact with things like automated shades um, or solar panels on the roof to make sure that we are using the energy wisely, uh, security systems that might use the occupancy sensors as well. Again, ton of options there. So with those two new recognition categories, um, <laughs> one may not be too useful to schools, but maybe they're doing some horticultural lighting in, in some classrooms. But really, um, I think the innovative maintenance operation and financing models um, that includes you know, different approaches to fund integrated lighting might fit well in a school. And this could be lighting as a service or different utility incentives or really any alternative financing options. Um, okay, next slide. All right, so if you know of a project or know someone that might be interested in being recognized by DOE, this is the form you would fill out. Basically tell your story of the project, how it fits into the recognition categories, and then you provide some supporting data, um, such as building the number of buildings impacted, energy savings, incentives, that type of thing. Okay, last slide is the next one. So here's the timeline for this year, but really what happens beyond recognition is where the campaign really seeks to add value. We really try to create a body of knowledge from the recognized projects. Um, some basic information about each project and its benefits is shared during recognition, but really more in-depth case studies are planned for development um, for some of those recognized projects. We've just published a couple on our website. Also newsletter articles uh, are as a way we can communicate about these projects throughout the year. So really, again, creating that body, body of knowledge and recognizing cool installations of lighting. Okay, that's my last slide. Uh, thank you for having me again. Well, thank you, Axel. So I'm next. I'm a research scientist uh, and from Berkeley Lab in California. Um, I've been in the lab for about 10 years. My background is in indoor air quality building ventilation and studying the impacts to energy and human health. Next. And today I'm joined by um, two guests. One is a campaign participant, the Charleston County School District in South Carolina, represented by Ron Kramps, who is the Executive Director of Facility Management. And I have a second guest today. Uh, he is a campaign supporter whole building system represented by Dennis Knight, who is the principal and CEO. And you may also know Dennis from his role at ASHRAE. And Ron and Dennis are gonna share with you some projects and their on the ground experiences that showcase the type of success story that we want to amplify in my own campaign. Next. So you wanna start by giving you an overview of the campaign. It's a little different. You heard about two uh, technology focused campaign. This one is focused on uh, a type of building, schools. Uh, and I'm the campaign lead, and I wanted to give you um, some, uh, share with you the recognition category. So give you really a sense of our core objectives. And then I'll hand the mic over to Ron and Dennis. Next. So the Efficient and Healthy School campaigns aim to engage K-12 schools to improve energy performance and indoor air quality. And we recognize that these, there is an immense need to address both through HVAC and other facility improvements. This is a campaign led by the US Department of Energy uh, with Berkeley Lab assisting, but we're unique in that we have two other agencies involved, the Department of Education and US EPA. Uh, we're working together because we realize that there's a lot of existing relationship these agencies have built with schools. And want to be built to point that and align our objectives. Um, for example, I'm, you know, Parkway schools mentioned that they are also uh, taking role in the Green Ribbon School that's run by the Department of Education. And for US EPA, there's a long program called the IAQ Tools for Schools. Um, and our campaign is working with that program so that we are aligned. Next. So our campaign um, is just starting. It's sort of like a kindergartner in the very first step of the journey. And I have a first grader and a preschooler at home. So I kind of really relate to this feeling of starting a journey together. Uh, we launched in August, 2021. And currently we have 23 districts representing about 700 schools that have joined us. The campaign is providing technical assistance and resources on best practice and guidance. We welcome all schools, K-12 schools to join us. 
And in our outreach, we really try to prioritize schools that are serving low income and underserved communities. And also in, the, in those rural, more remote areas that are harder to reach. So aside from getting, uh, giving out free technical assistance from us, and my background is in indoor air quality. If you have an indoor air quality question, come to me and at Berkeley Lab with a team of um, uh, experts in different areas. Um, you can also get recognized uh, for your hard work in improving energy efficiency and indoor air quality. Um, and if you're not a school, but you are whether a state agency, an engineer, vendor, community organizations, we also welcome you to join us and show your support. Next. So I mentioned that we just launched last August and I'm happy to report that we have completed the first round of recognition. Just wanna show you the highlights of some of the categories that we are recognizing really gives you a flavor of the core objectives this campaign wants to spotlight. The first is um, HVAC inspection and maintenance. These are good practices that we think all schools should be doing. So, and as we know, um, the more upkeep that you're doing to ensure adequate ventilation, effective filtration, the more prepared you are. Uh, efficient HVAC, I think I heard uh, Parkway mention, Hannah mentioned that um, when they replace equipment, they go a little step beyond, they don't do just like to like. And it's the same idea here. When you replace your HVAC system, we look, look for those technical specification that, that the school district is committed to. So they're not doing like to like, but doing a little step extra to improve efficiency, improve performance. We also recognizing the importance of ongoing um, monitoring analytics and also a team approach to support strategic planning, which is so important that when funding is available, whether it's ESSER or something else, your school district is ready for it. And we recognize that in, court, in order to be strategic, you really need a whole team of collaborators, not just the facility manager, but the board, the administration really come together and support that activities. And with that, um, I'm gonna hand it over next to Ron, who's gonna share us some stories from Charleston County School District. All right, thanks very much, Renji. I'm Ron Crumps. I'm in charge of facilities management for Charleston County School District, where students are the heart of our work. And I'm gonna be discussing strategies for improving energy efficiency and health in our facilities. So next slide, where in the world is Charleston County? There it is on the left, it's mid-coastal South Carolina. And on the right, there is a map of uh, the district. And of course, you can't read all that, but that's just to show that we're all over the county. Next slide. And let's look at the stats. So about 88 schools, charters, and programs, together with uh, 24 other facilities, such as leased and storage and admin and bus lots, et cetera. So 112 properties or campuses, about 10 million square feet, and uh, about 50,000 students. We are one of the 70 largest urban districts in the country. So we're part of the Council of the Great City Schools. Uh, since we're talking about energy efficiency, how's my organization doing? Well, next slide. So here's our EUI tracker. Back in 2000, the state established a goal of a 1% reduction in energy use intensity per year in all the school districts. So you see our baseline was about 50, and there's the, the yellow line is the goal of 1% of 1 reduction and we've achieved about 1.5. So we've done really well in uh, reducing energy use intensity across the district. Next slide, please. Now, if there were just one topic that I could discuss, it would be this one. It would be facility asset management as a mindset because without a clear sense of ownership of facilities, they'll, they'll not be properly managed. If you see a facility that isn't properly managed or a system that's not properly managed, it's probably because no one is taking ownership you've got to designate asset managers of all your facilities and your systems. In, in my case, that's about 14 men and women who are asset managers of the various systems that I manage, such as HVAC, restrooms, playgrounds, et cetera. And I expect all those individuals to understand the, the list of assets, the systems that they're managing, the condition, the maintenance requirements, the cost to maintain. Uh, they control the design specs for those items for new construction even. And they each give me an annual status of assets presentation, me and my boss and the other leadership of uh, my organization. And, and that's been very powerful. It's a very powerful concept, I think. And again, without a clear sense of ownership, facilities will not be properly managed. So, but with that map, that uh, mindset, let's take a look at uh, strategic framework. Next slide for energy efficiency and healthy schools. So here's some big picture items that flow from this mindset. And lead to success in energy efficiency and health in our facilities. And the first is a biennial condition assessment. We do 
an assessment. It's really continuous. We get to every school about every two years. That leads to a long range uh, capital maintenance plan. We call it capital maintenance or capital renewal. For us, that's about 100 projects every year worth about 50 million. So we're continually recapitalizing our facilities. Another critical item is what I would call energy regulations a standard oper operating procedure that governs how we do energy conservation and what everyone's role is in energy conservation. Our program includes audits and an energy incentive program. Seven times a year, we're auditing all of our schools with a checklist. And then we have a pool of about $350,000 and we pay an incentive back to all the schools based on how they're doing on those checklists. And it just incentivizes them to help us save energy. They use that money for enhancing the education experience in the classroom. Finally, I'd be a fool to not mention a roof maintenance program as an important part of any maintenance program that in, improves energy efficiency and healthy and healthy environments in the school. So these are some big picture items that flow uh, from the, the asset management mindset and lead to success. Now, let me mention a few other tactical items. Next slide, please. Uh, for day-to-day -day attention to energy efficiency, starting with a good HVAC filter program and a, a good vendor helps. In my case, it's Tridem Filter Corporation and MERV 13 is achievable. Uh, I would suggest an, an energy contractor partnership with with a control vendor. In our case, we have a controls vendor who maintains our controls. And what better way to enhance energy conservation than to have that same vendor helping us manage those controls in such a way that we save energy. It's a, it's a marriage made in heaven, if, in my opinion. Uh, next, uh, rigorous intentional preventative maintenance program. I have a preventative maintenance shop and that's their focus. And finally, rigorous monitoring via our building automation system that you're finding problems before the occupants do. Uh, with a focus on saving energy. So these are daily tasks that support energy conservation. Next slide, please. And finally, I'd be foolish to not mention custodial support, uh, which leads to occupant health and well being in our facility. So, as you might imagine, we're doing the weekly fogging and sanitizing via backpack and rolled sprayers, handing out hand sanitizer and masks and other personal protective equipment, of course. Uh, using custodial checklists for wipe downs and cleaning restrooms and things of that nature, and an integrated pest management program, which is really important where all the occupants of the facility understand their role in keeping pests out in a, in a healthy indoor, indoor environment for the school. Now, next slide. Let me highlight a few of my ESSER three projects. I mentioned a robust capital maintenance program that we have, and I wanted to highlight a few projects uh, actually, that Dennis Knight is helping us with. So he'll he'll be talking about some other projects as well. But here's our Baptist Hill High School uh, roof and HVAC replacement. It's a very typical capital maintenance kind of project where we're replacing a modified bitumen roof with a fluid applied system, uh, replacing old aged RTUs with new energy efficient equipment, achieving MERV 13 filtration. And the, uh, the outcome is, of course, an improved envelope, a leak-free roof, 20-year warranty, R20 insulation, new HVAC units and, and more outdoor, outdoor air. So a, a very good project. This is really just completing. We've, we've already got about probably 50 to 60% of the facility done. So this completes the rest of the facility. Next slide, please, is our uh, Mini Hughes Elementary School, a very similar project to the one I just mentioned, new modified bit roof, new rooftop RTUs, uh, MERV 13 filtration, uh, R20 insulation roof, et cetera. So a good, uh, a good HVAC and roof project. And finally, next slide, my last slide, one more ESSER three project, and that's our military magnet high school HVAC replacement. So in this case, replacing existing HVAC split systems and scholar units and rooftop units with new equipment, then uh, we'll have better filtration and upgraded outdoor air. So uh, another good capital maintenance project. Well, with that, uh, that's a com completion of my discussion of strategies for improving energy efficiency and health in our schools. And I'll be handing the mic to Dennis Knight to talk some more about this. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ron. And, um, and, and thanks for the segue in. Uh, I will, uh, before I go into my slides, just uh, take this opportunity. Uh, well, you can go to the next slide and uh, we'll just start there. Um, I've had the privilege, me and my firm have had the privilege of working with the Charleston County School District for uh, a little over 42 years uh, uh, with the current business um, uh, whole building systems um, consultancy for the last 12 years and, and the pleasure to work with Ron and his team for about a decade now. 
Um, and I think what's really key is when, when Ron came on board at the Charleston County School District and began assembling and organizing his team, the first thing he managed, I think, was a paradigm shift for Charleston County Schools. And that's having a, a facility management, uh, facility asset management mindset. And I think that's key. And as I go through some of these things, uh, uh, you'll, you'll understand why I say that. Uh, we've worked with them to develop a, a rigorous set of design guidelines that get updated every year. Uh, we began, and then that's been handed off to uh, uh, the uh, controls vendor who, who does do the monitoring now, but we went through a portfolio-wide energy built benchmarking and identified what we called the energy hogs in the district that were uh, then prioritized for HVAC upgrades. We primarily focus on those MEP design for total HVAC replacements, so existing buildings. And the one thing, again, that uh, I'd commend the district on is uh, for now, for about a decade, we've been commissioning all new construction projects. And now for about the last five years, we also uh, commission the HVAC replacement projects. So uh, trying to get the uh, facility asset set management and the operational phase of a building off to a good start. And uh, then lastly, but not least, uh, when Ron came on board, he looked at all of the consultants, including myself, and, 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 and told us, look, if we're going to do uh, design work for the school district, and if we're going to do HVAC replacements, he intends for the indoor air quality in the existing buildings when we're finished to be equal to or better than, than new construction that's being built to current standards and codes. And so that's been our marching orders now for well over a decade. And I think you could see that by the, some of the, the performance metrics that he provided there. Next slide. <clears throat> uh, so I'm gonna talk specifically about St. John's High School. It's very similar to the, the three schools, John, um, uh, Ron showed uh, uh, that we did uh, replacements for, but we, again, uh, want to improve uh, the energy efficiency and indoor air quality in the schools. Uh, one thing you'll notice in the Southeast a lot are we, we are air-based or air-cooled DX uh, applications for the most part, but most of it's heat pumps. So that's helping uh, uh, with our electrification initiatives that the DOE talks about and also uh, moving us toward decarbonization as we uh, uh, decarbonize the grid and are able to uh, take some load off with, with, with heat pump technology. Uh, we replace end of life equipment with super efficient units. So we typically strive for something uh, that, that started out at about um, uh, an EER of eight and, and get, get uh, our, our SEERS and EERs in, into the uh, 14 and 16 range. So that one thing that allows us to do is we've, we've updated, I think I've been in, uh, involved in projects now over the last seven years that, that have replaced about a thousand pieces of equipment or so, but we've been able to do that without significant electrical upgrades to the building. So we've reduced demand, uh, reduced uh, the size of uh, power uh, circuits required to the units, so uh, the existing circuit can serve it, and we can adjust for that with a uh, circuit breaker disconnect right at the equipment without upgrading the power distribution. We've integrated de dedicated outdoor air systems uh, and demand control ventilation with energy recovery everywhere we can. Uh, St. John's High School, we also went in to and did lighting upgrades converted to LED lighting and an envelope improvement with a, with a roof replacement. And uh, we improved IEQ conditions and, um, and um, hit a 57% energy cost savings over the baseline. And that was uh, validated uh, by third party uh, uh, 179D, uh, third party energy assessment uh, by another consultant. Next slide. <clears throat> So again, we've uh, uh, yeah, made our roofs wider. We've, we've cleaned up the roofs. We've uh, 
uh, gotten the equipment uh, to where it's it's seismically and, and wind restrained where the old equipment was weren't. So we've added to the sustainability and resiliency of the buildings as well. Uh, put all the equipment down on uh, rather than go with curb adapters that sets equipment up another two or three feet above the, the roof. We replaced the curbs, one, one for seismic and wind, but also to help the maintenance staff be able to get to the equipment. And when they can get to the equipment and have access to it, it's, it's easier to maintain it and, and tends to get maintained more often. Next slide. And you can see from the technology that giant um, old dedicated air, outdoor air unit got replaced with the more compact unit where the energy wheels and things are uh, arranged to where we take, take load off. We've not had to do a structural or, or roof upgrade on some buildings that have been as old as 50 years old uh, by taking the approach of more energy efficient, smaller and lighter equipment. By the way, we also run, um, once we've taken into account the changes in use, reduce plug loads in a building, things like that, we run a, a standard ASHRAE uh, 140 compliant uh, building energy model on all the upgrades to uh, uh, right size the equipment before we go into the renovation. Uh, next slide. So, uh, Renji uh, mentioned uh, my involvement with ASHRAE. I'm a former board member and I'm, I'm here in Las Vegas actually at our winter meeting and uh, uh, we'll say that I was just nominated to become the, the next treasurer of ASHRAE starting in July if our ballots come in um, favorably. But uh, I have been the vice chair of ASHRAE's Epidemic Task Force uh, over the last two years. Many of you may have uh, heard of that, but uh, on our ASHRAE website, if you haven't, you go to ASHRAE and go to COVID-19 resources and you'll find maybe a thousand pages of guidance depending on any uh, building occupancy type. But our core recommendations are follow public health advisory uh, recommendations, improve ventilation, filtration, and air cleaning, uh, air distribution. So uh, look at your air distribution and and adjust it where necessary to get good mixing um, and proper HVAC operations. So a lot of guidance on how to assess your systems and, and simple checklists to uh, do the kinds of inspections that Ron talks about have, have built in and put, been put on automatic pilot in the Charleston County School District. And then finally, uh, uh, HVAC commissioning, uh, which I mentioned. And, uh, I will also say that uh, um, the earlier speaker talked about the 50% design guides and, and moving toward a net zero design guide. And as of this meeting too, ASHRAE has uh, become very involved in moving probably into the biggest initiative since uh, we introduced 90.1 back in 1975, and that is um, zero net carbon. So. Uh, uh, that includes uh, embodied carbon and uh, operational carbon. So uh, moving forward, you'll see a lot of information and new standards and, and guidelines coming out of ASHRAE to help our uh, design engineers, our owners, and our federal agencies to uh, begin moving toward those uh, zero net carbon targets we're, we're setting for ourselves. Next slide. All right, I'll, I'll add one last comment. Uh, the ASHRAE headquarters that was mentioned, uh, it's 67,000 square feet. Uh, it was a 1970s vintage building and, and we did hit uh, a 50% envelope upgrade. Um, we, we completely reclad the building with a uh, new rain screen type system that also improved uh, insulation on the walls, uh, windows and the roof. And uh, in October, we went live with our solar array. So the building is anticipated to perform at net zero energy now. And uh, with that, uh, Renji and Claire, that's, uh, that's the end of my comments. All right, thanks, uh, 
Dennis, uh, for that, and thanks for for pointing pointing that out. I know you pointed that out to us in the in the chat for those, so I appreciate that the additional comment about the improvements uh, to the Ashbury Building in Georgia. So thank you for that. And thanks to, to all the speakers as well. Uh, so what we'll do is, um, I guess we'll open up the uh, session to to Q and A, uh, and you know if you do have a question, uh, please. Uh, type your question in, uh, in the Q and A uh, box uh, located on the bottom of your of your Zoom screen. But I do have I do have uh, one question uh, for Dennis. Uh, so Dennis, um, what I'll do is I'll read the question so that folks can can hear it, and then that way you can go ahead and address it. It looks like a two part question. Uh, first is, do you have a published case study on AHU to heat pump replacement? Or could you please describe the replacement process in parentheses, so say modeling, uh, cost evaluation, et cetera? Thanks. Uh, sure. Well, most of, um, uh, for the last uh, 30, 30 years or so, most of our equipment has been heat pump based. However, um, our process, again, is we go out, we do an assessment, we do a conditions assessment, we look at the buildings, uh, we sit down with, with staff, both operational staff and the teaching staff, and find out what the, what the occupancy is. Is it still the same, or is the space use category still the same? Um, we run the model. Uh, we look at lighting and whether lighting has been upgraded or if it's planned to be upgraded. Same with the roof. Um, we run those models. Uh, we generate a, a large spreadsheet that includes the existing equipment, uh, its, its energy efficiency, as well as its power service requirements. Uh, we put that side by side with new proposed uh, basis of design equipment. And we been, begin tweaking that equi those equipment selections and with the goal of getting all of them at or below and, and normally significantly below uh, their original power requirements. So that uh, tends to cut both demand and consumption. I think you could see from that, uh, that graph that, that Ron put up that that one and a half percent per year uh, savings has been significant. Uh, uh, so that's what we've done. Um, now, when you're looking at uh, in colder climates, and, and I don't, uh, I don't, I have not worked in, but I've just seen a recent study and uh, I will find the source of it. I believe it was a student at maybe Carnegie Mellon uh, looking at New York City and uh, heat pump technology has uh, tremendously improved. We've got units that'll work down to minus 37 degrees. And uh, so we're seeing that, um, or at least the students uh, project and some of the retrofits going on in New York City is that they can meet both their heating and cooling with, with industrial grade type heat pumps that can produce chill water and hot water, retrofit mm -hmm. a high rise building um, and, and even use the heat pump to meet heating requirements for uh, up to 70% of the year. And then supplement that with their existing boiler uh, systems or, or, or newer uh, gas boilers and, and at reduced load and, and get the 96% decarbonization uh, which is tremendous uh, without having to do major infrastructure or structural changes to the facility. So I think between the ASHRAE headquarters showing what you can do with a 1974 building um, from a cost effective standpoint and, and then some of this, uh, some of the new things coming out that, that uh, uh, we can transition our, our uh, existing building stock efficiently and get to nearly zero carbon emissions uh, here within the next few years. Yeah, and yeah, no, no, I definitely agree. Okay, well, that that was actually the only question posted. I don't know if, if uh, any of the attendees, you know, if you have any other questions. Um, what I'll do is I'm just going to kind of walk through some of the 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 next slides, and if any other questions pop up before we finish. I'll, I'll raise them to the um, to the panelists. So um, I just want to let let uh, folks know that uh, that today isn't the last time you'll you'll hear from from the building envelope campaign uh, and these other campaigns. Um, we hope 
that you'll uh, you'll join us for a second webinar in, in, in our series titled um, "How Multifamily Buildings Can Benefit uh, from DOE uh, Technology Campaigns," um, and that will be uh, in March on the second of March, same time uh, as this webinar. Um, uh, next next slide. And uh, just a comment on the Better Buildings uh, webinar uh, series slide. Um, so if you can't wait until next month, uh, you can go out and, and check out uh, any of the webinar uh, series. Um, you can see that there are quite a few uh, presentations through April. Uh, so by all means, you know you can visit the Better Buildings Solution Center and then learn more about these uh, webinars uh, and also how to register for them. Um, and so the, the next slide. Um, so the next uh, Better Buildings, uh, Better Plants Summit uh, will take place in May. That's May 17th through 19th. Uh, and the event uh, will feature uh, engaging and interactive sessions as well as opportunities for attendees uh, to network with industry peers and experts. Uh, and while we are in planning an in-person event this year, uh, we will make a final decision, I think, by the end of the month, uh, as far as uh, how that's going to play out. Uh, registration will be coming soon uh, for that. So visit uh, the Better Building Solutions Center just to, to learn more. Um, so I don't, I don't see any other questions uh, popping up. Um, so we've, we've reached four o'clock, one minute after four o'clock. So with that, I just want to thank uh, all the panelists uh, for, for their presentation. I thought the presentations were great. Uh, and then, um, again, if anybody has any other questions, um, I think you will get, uh, you do have the contact information for all of, all of the uh, panelists uh, that presented. So feel free uh, to reach out uh, with any questions uh, directly. Um, and I think with that, I just wanna say thanks again to, to all the, the panelists. Uh, and thanks for those that uh, that attended as well. Appreciate it. That will conclude the session. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony.